biology. So let's now go to question number two. So for the question number two, we are being told that the diagram below illustrates two common bacteria, which is bacteria labeled A and bacteria labeled B, that causes cholera, that is for A, and causes typhoid, that is for B, respectively. So Roman one is asking, identify the organism A and B, as you can look in the diagram. So these are the bacteria. So identify the organism A and identify the organism B. So in this case, the organism A, that is Vibrio cholerae, and then organism B, that is Salmonella typhi bacteria. So how do you identify Vibrio cholerae bacteria? So the Vibrio cholerae bacteria, they look like a comma. They exactly look like a comma, the, the symbol comma. They exactly look like that. So this question was testing on binomial nomenclature. So the normal binomial nomenclature we know in biology. So this question was testing a concept on binomial nomenclature. Specifically, it was testing the rules for writing scientific names. Because the Vibrio cholerae and Salmonella typhi, those are scientific names. For you to get this answer correctly, you must include all the rules of scientific naming. So remember, the genus name must always begin with a capital letter. And then all the other words, including the species, must be small letter. The names must not be underlined using one line, but they must be underlined separately. That is when you handwrite the names. So if you handwrite the names, you should underline them separately. So that is what this question was testing. Because in an exam situation, if you only write Vibrio cholerae and you don't follow the rules of scientific naming, so you are going to get that question wrong. Even not half marks, you are going to get it wrong. Because for all scientific names in biology, you must write them in scientific manner. So for the Vibrio cholerae, you must, the Vibrio should begin with the capital, cholerae should be in small. Also Salmonella typhi is another scientific name for the bacteria which causes the typhoid. So the next question is asking, Name the kingdom to which the organisms belong. So which kingdom do these two organisms belong? So these organisms belong to kingdom Monera because they are bacteria. So remember in the first uh, part of the question, we're being told that these are bacteria A and B. So all bacteria belong to kingdom Monera. That is uh, the answer to this question. So name the kingdom to which these organisms belong. So these organisms belong to kingdom Monera um, in classification. So not to forget we have different kingdoms of classification apart from kingdom Monera. So remember the kingdoms of classification we have kingdom Animalia comprising of all the animals. Apart from that we have kingdom Plantae. Apart from that we have kingdom Fungi. Apart from kingdom Fungi remember we have kingdom Protoctista. It can be called kingdom Protoctista. You may also call it kingdom Protista or you may also call it kingdom Eukaryota. So you can call them uh, any of those names, it is still correct. And the last kingdom is Kingdom Monera, which is the smallest kingdom comprising of only one organism, which is the bacteria. So for this Kingdom Monera, it can be called Kingdom Monera or it can be called Kingdom Prokaryota. So remember for the Kingdom Protoctista, they can be called Kingdom Eukaryota or Protoctista or Protista. But for Kingdom Monera, you can call them Kingdom Monera or you can call them kingdom, uh, kingdom prokaryota. So this prokaryota word comes from prokaryotic cell. And what is a prokaryotic cell? Remember we said a prokaryotic cell, this is a cell uh, whereby the organelles and the nucleus do not have a membrane. That's why kingdom monera, they are called uh, prokaryota because the nucleus and all the other organelles are found suspended within the, the cytoplasm without a membrane. For Kingdom Protoctista, we see that it is also called eukaryota because it means uh, this name comes from a eukaryotic cell. And what is a eukaryotic cell? So these are cells which the organelles and the nucleus possesses a membrane. So let's go to quest Roman 3. Roman 3 is asking, identify the structures labeled X and Y in the diagram. So if you look at the diagram, so identify the structure labeled X and the structure labeled Y. So remember, for structure labeled X is found in B. For the structure labeled Y, it is found in letter A. So let's begin with structure labeled X. So for the structure labeled X, this structure is called the cilium. So this is the cilium structure. And structure labeled Y, this is the flagellum. 
you should take note that in biology singularity and plural is very critical for letter x if you call that uh, cilia you are going to get it wrong because remember that label is only pointing uh, one part of the diagram and also for letter y that label is only pointing one part of the diagram so it means that that is singular you cannot call it cilia and for y you cannot call it flagella because cilia is plural flagella is plural so you must give it a singular name which is adding a um so that means that for letter x that is the cilium and for letter y remember that is the flagellum so you should always remember that in biology plural and singular it is very critical in answering the question so let's now go to question number three and it's asking state two reasons that make a bat to be classified as a mammal yet it can be able to fly so what are the reasons why a bat is called and is classified under being a mammal yet this organism can be able to fly it is the only flying mammal that we have around no other mammal can be able to fly except the bat so why is it considered a mammal and not a bird so there are very many reasons so the first reason you can give we see that the bat has mammary glands so it possesses mammary glands which are used to feed its young ones so for the mammary glands uh, all mammals possess mammary glands including the whale so like for example you can see this is the mammary gland of the human and that is the mammary gland of the bird so these are the mammary glands which are used to feed the young ones and give them milk and nourishment so for the bat also it possesses the mammary glands apart from that you can also see that the bat also possesses the external part of the ear which is called the pinna so the bat also possesses the pinna which supports that a bat is a mammal apart from that you can see that the body of the bird is covered with hair so the whole body of the bird is covered with mm, is covered with hair so since it's covered with hair it is only mammals body that are covered with hair or fur so this one also supports that the bat is uh, can be classified as a mammal and not a bird because birds possess feathers bat here possesses the hairs apart from that the most common one you can see that the bat gives rise or rather the bat gives birth to its young one so it doesn't lay eggs and then they hatch so it gives birth to live offsprings so apart from that we can also give another reason and say that the bat is a heterodont and what is a heterodont organism so a heterodont organism is an organism which possesses different sizes and shapes of the teeth that is a heterodont also for the bat we see that its teeth inside the jawbone are of different sizes and shapes so it is only the mammals which possesses different sizes, sizes and shapes of teeth thereby being called the heterodont so remember in the topic of nutrition in the subtopic of teeth we say that the opposite of heterodont is homodont so the most common organisms which are homodonts are the fish because if you look at the teeth of the fish you are going to see that they are all uniform the same size and the same shape that's why for the fish they are homodonts but for the bat and the mammals they are heterodonts because the teeth has different sizes and shapes so lastly for now we can say that the bat also possesses lungs which are used for gases exchange so all these points support that the bat is a mammal and not any other organism so that's why uh, for this bat it can be classified under being a mammal and not any other organism out there so question letter b was asking name the taxonomic unit that comes immediately after phylum in classification so name the taxonomic unit that comes immediately after phylum in classification so the answer to this is class so it is the class which comes immediately after phylum and division it is the class so that is our answer if you can look at this hierarchy of classification it begins from the kingdom and ends with the species therefore in an exam situation if you have been asked to to list the hierarchy of classification you must list this hierarchy of classification from the uh, from the largest to the smallest or maybe if the question is asking from the smallest to the largest then begin from the species and end to the kingdom so for this point you can see that you should never change this hierarchy maybe if the question is asking you to list the hierarchy never interchange any of these things maybe you say the first one is kingdom the next one is phylum the third one is family the fourth one is species 
So they must follow themselves in order, be it that you are beginning in the ascending order or the descending order. So they must follow themselves in order from the first to the last or the last to the first. Also, when writing this hierarchy of classification, you should always include phylum or division. You should never say, uh, maybe for example, kingdom, phylum, class, order. Never omit phylum, never omit division. They must be there together. Because for the phylum, phylum represents the animals, while division represents the plant. And in classification to the previous class, remember we say that there are two types of phylum, uh, whereby we have phylum caudata, these are organisms which possess a backbone, or the vertebrates. This is the phylum arthropoda, these are organisms which do not have a backbone, therefore they are called the invertebrates. So for the division, remember also in classification, we studied the different division in plants. We said we have division bryophyta, pteridophyta, and spermatophyta, which comprises of the monocots and the dicots. So don't forget that. If you missed that class, check the previous videos. We cover that in detail classification. So let's now go to the next question, which is question number four. So question number four is asking, besides venation, State two are the external characteristics of the leaves that can be used to classify the plant. So besides venation, so we have been told not to include venation in our answer. So besides venation, state two are the external characteristics of the leaves that can be used to classify, uh, to classify plants. So if you, if you look at these leaves, uh, this leaf, apart from venation, there are very many things we can talk about which you can use to classify the leaf. So the first one we can use a leaf margin because we have different leaf margin. We have serrated leaf margin, we have dentated leaf margin, we have rough leaf margin, we have smooth leaf margin, etc., etc. Apart from that, we can also talk about the leaf apex. So apex hapoju. We can also talk about the leaf apex whereby we have pointed leaf apex, we have round leaf apex, we have uh, lobed leaf apex, etc., etc. So apart from that, we can talk about the leaf size or the leaf shape. Because there are some leaves which are very large, there are some leaves which are very narrow, there are some leaves which are very long, there are some leaves which are very short. Apart from that, we can talk about the, the petiole. Because we see most of the monocotyledonous leaves, they possess a pet, um, most dicotyledonous, sorry, most dicotyledonous leaves, they possess a petiole or a leaf stalk. But most of the monocotyledonous leaves, they possess a sheath. So they don't have a stalk. So they have a sheath, uh, like whereby this sheath, this is the part of attachment of the leaf to the branch or the stem. So remember, for the dicotyledonous leaves, they have a stalk or a petiole, but for the monocotyledonous leaf, they, uh, they do not have a stalk. They only have a sheath, which is a point of attachment of the leaf to the stalk of the plant. Biology.